with this, I am going to be um, fusing the damar directly into the oil, which is why it requires a little bit of heat. And then I, there's no, there's no thinner, there's no turpentine in this, which will make it much more stable and recept or resistant toward uh, any sort of um, like uh, dissolution when applying or removing varnish or like working on the subsequent layers. Um, it does seem like a lot of resin, or a, of Damar at least from my perspective, but I'm making like an insane amount of this medium just because it's, it's quite messy and it's time consuming to do. So I just like to do it once and do some variations off of it and then just have the medium forever. But anyways, so you could use like a mortar and pestle or something like that. I'm just using a plastic bags and like double bagging it. And then off camera, I just have like a hammer on the concrete. I'm just like, it just like, it, shatters into a million pieces. The The benefit of Damar is that it gives a, a shine uh, and it helps not have it not the painting not sink in as much, but it also adds a bit of brittleness to the painting, which is why I'm adding black oil and uh, vacuum body linseed oil, along with some other things I'll talk about later because that will kind of help uh, counteract the brittleness that the Damar it is, uh, is the weakness of the Damar. But it's a very small amount. If you keep the ratio less than 5%, you shouldn't have to wor anything to worry about. And then the beeswax, I haven't used in a medium before, so I'm really excited to experiment with this. Again, like using 1 8th of the amount of the oil, because with beeswax, if you add too much, summer months, your paintings are just gonna melt. So very small amount of beeswax for the amount of oil I'm gonna use. So going back to the oil, I'm using one cup of this Pale's Grinders, Pale Grinders oil, and I just kind of prioritize using a little higher quality oil um, that's a little paler because I am using black oil, which is going to affect the color. It's gonna make it a little darker, but as like jet black as this black oil is, it's extremely transparent. So I, I'm not really worried about it, even if the medium is a bit darker. Once you add it into whites, like you really can't tell at all. And another really cool thing about the black oil is that you basically have already aged it. It's basically as dark as the oil is ever going to get. And so if you paint with the black oil, the actual like color and value and saturation of that painting is not gonna change over like hundreds of years because it's already like reached its maximum. Because even like cleaned linseed oil, it is gonna darken over time, like no matter how clean it is. If it's sun bleached, that will darken. Uh, you want it to be as pure as possible, purified as possible, but even the really pale linseed oil will darken over time. Black oil will not darken any over time. And so if you key your painting in relation to how it looks, you know, with the black oil, which means you might have to key things up like an eighth of a value lighter or something very subtle like that, then you don't have to worry about changing over time, over a long period of time. So I'm using the pale grinders oil, some of this black oil I made. Um, if, if, if you are sensitive or you don't want to use anything that's like, especially toxic. Black oil does have lead in it, so don't use that. <laughs> but for, for me, it's quite a crucial characteristic that I want to imbue into this medium because the black oil is gonna expedite the drying time immensely. Lead is a great dryer and adds flexibility to it, so it's just the perfect uh, addition for what I'm using it for. So I'm using like a half a cup of vacuum body blendseed oil which is just like a really thick, it's kind of similar to like stand oil or epoxide oil, but it's a little slower drying. And then the black oil I made, so like half a cup of each. And then I think like I'll add a little bit more black oil, which will also kind of dilute the amount of Damar and beeswax that I'm using in the mix. Most of these oils that I like, if I'm not like refining myself, I, I like from like Ruvlev Natural Pigments. I get a lot of the raw material from there. And then heating it up, I'm gonna be heating it up like the lowest temperature that I can possibly do. When you make the black oil, you heat it at quite a high temperature. You have to keep it pretty stable at a very specific temperature range. For this, I'm not like cooking the oil. All I want it to be is hot enough that it can dissolve the beeswax and the damar and nothing really hotter. I was gonna use this for measurement, but I ended up just doing a, just like relational measurements more than like weighing the individual components just to keep it simple. I always kind of err on the safe side with, with these things. So I really don't have to worry about um, damaging any paintings. It's very much like Tylenol, 
where you know you can OD on Tylenol, but doesn't mean that it's not effective or helpful. It's just about the, the quantity that you take of it and the situation you use it for. So that's the exact same with this medium. If you, if you use way too much beeswax in it, your paint's gonna melt. If you use way too much Damar, it's also gonna melt and it's gonna dissolve when you try to put a varnish on it or any sort of thing that has any sort of uh, thinner in it. And, but if you use the right ratio, which is a very small amount, and even this medium, you, you know, I'm keeping it like, well, it'll be like one part medium to four part paints, one to two at the very, very most for maybe a couple very sharp impasto highlights or something like that. But keeping that ratio uh, so it's mostly paint, and this is just kind of augmenting that paint just the slightest amount, is, is, is actually going to give more strength to the painting, which is really great. But I think a lot of people try to look for characteristics uh, of how to change paint, where in reality, if you just make your own paint, it has those characteristics you're looking for intrinsically. But a lot of tube paint, it just, with the stabilizers, it just kind of gets rid of any of the individuality of the pigments. Um, but anyway, so I'm adding in the powderized Damar, and I was actually surprised how well this just like, kind of like exploded into powder. So this is exactly the brittleness that you don't want too much of in the painting, but a little bit of it will really help uh, not have your painting sink in, which will mean you can see the, the values and the saturation for what it is, even when it's dry, which will allow you to not have to oil in more and be able to see the values well, which uh, the less oil you use, the more archival and stable your painting will be. So. It all has a benefit, it all has a purpose. So I've mixed in these pellets, it's just like raw, raw beeswax. Um, I think it's just like filtered, so there's no like contaminants or anything in it. It's, it's super uh, clean, but it's also like not processed. I'm really curious what the effects are gonna be from adding like the, fusing the Damar into this, because I have made like a Marge medium before, which uh, is like mixing like black oil with mastic varnish. And uh, black oil and mastic marsh combined has this really weird effect where it gel jellifies itself, which yeah, is, is just really bizarre, but it's, it's, a, it's a medium you gotta be careful with. You don't wanna use too much of it, but um, you know, there are historical paintings that are done with variations of this mastic varnish, some of them which have, are in perfect condition and other ones which are just completely decimated for the people that, that didn't know how to use it right. It can um, like, just darken your painting like crazy. But if you know how to use it right, which was uh, not using it as like a glaze or anything like that, but just uh, working very directly with it. So there's only one or two passes at most of it, I think was kind of this consensus of what made it the most archival. And so uh, I would assume similar things with this. So I'm not gonna be like using this indirectly. I will probably not use this at all in the beginning. And then I probably have one pass either the last pass or somewhere toward the end where I'll use it. Um, yeah, so this is kind of like a, a finessing, a finalizing thing, but I still like to work as lean as possible in the beginning, so just paint and oil, and there's so much variety you can get with that just by making your own paints. So this is very much just the, the cherry on top. Okay, this is where things get pretty dicey. So this would be a perfectly usable medium to begin with. Because I made it on the little bit on the conservative side with adding the beeswax and the damar, it's gonna be a little bit of like a really loose jelly once it fully cools. Um, I'm adding this one last thing, which you'll see me struggle with for quite some time. This is Canadian balsam. And so it's the it's the resin, the, the um, filtered resin of the Canadian balsam tree. And what's so unique about this, and it's quite expensive, you can get like larch balsam and some other things, which I think would be indistinguishable for this use of it. But what's unique about Canadian balsam is that it has the exact same refractive index of that of glass. So you're essentially adding like a glass-like effect to it. So I'm using hardly any of this again because Canadian balsam is, is very brittle, much like the Damar. But I am, the Damar and the Canadian Balsam are the only like brittleness that I'm bringing to this medium. Everything else is going to help uh, with the flexibility so that I won't have to worry about it painting it on like a stretched canvas or anything like that. I can't uh, emphasize enough how little of this stuff I'm using. I'm literally just gonna do like a couple drops once I finally get it out. I, I have very little of this stuff left. Um, I, I would use this a lot at the Academy. Very little, but frequently throughout the painting process in the later stages of a painting. Um, and so anyways, I think there's just like the ratio of the, uh, the, um,
cannabis balsam to like the kind of air that was in the container kind of thickened it. I haven't used this also for like pretty much at all since I've been out of the academy. I've been using a lot of um, like just a little bit of stand oil and, and some other things, but here we go. I finally get it coming out. Um, but anyways, after I get this in and at the end and just kind of mix it all around so that gets dissolved as well, uh, it, it's good to go. Like you could you could let this cool a little bit, not entirely, because it'll be harder to bottle if you let it completely harden. But I find it easier to bottle if it's kind of like in the middle where it's kind of more, it's thickened up a little, but it's, so it's not super runny, but uh, it's still uh, not completely solid yet. And so I did make, uh, I will make a couple tubes of this stuff, but, um, yeah, this will be more like a gel, so this won't give it much more of a stringiness to it. It will give it like a gloss and it will help uh, uh, like all the brush marks kind of bleed together a little bit more. And so this has a really unique effect in itself and it's worth exploring. But for what I'm going after, I'm wanting to get it to be very kind of stringy so I can get these really sharp, precise uh, and pretty loose stringiness that is not like uh, super heavy and dense. Uh, with some of the other mediums I've made. Um, it's very like uh, personalized um, and so sometimes it can be hard to explain it to somebody who hasn't like spent so long exploring these different mediums or are so uh, in tune with painting. Um, so the Bologna chalk is really interesting. It's different than regular chalk. Bologna chalk has, um, I believe it's uh, calcium sulf sulfide sulfate. Um, I'll double check that. But in addition to the, the calcium carbonate, um, and so basically, I don't I don't know why, but that makes it more flexible. So this is better to use for flexible surfaces, whereas just using regular chalk would be better for like rigid surfaces, like priming wood or something that's mounted to something stable. Now, what this basically does is it it uh, modifies the ratio of um, the, the amount of oil in the media versus the pigment because chalk absorbs the pigments to a certain, or absorbs the oil, it, the oil coats the chalk pigment. And so if you're, what you want to do of following like the fat over lean principle of not like oversaturating your painting with oil in the early stages, uh, using a putty is a great way of being able to add medium into your paint, but still uh, be in very high control of the amount of oil that gets into your painting. Uh, because, you know, if you want to make, uh, I'm trying to think of a really opaque color, like if you want to make like a cadmium color really tra transparent, if you add a bunch of oil to it, it's going to, your fat over lean principle is like completely screwed. Like you're just going to have so much oil in that base layer. But if you add a putty, so like a little bit of oil with a bunch of chalk, then it's gonna be super transparent. So if you add a little bit of that cadmium red, it's not gonna turn pink. It's gonna stay a pretty uh, chromatic red, um, but you're gonna actually be able to like paint on top of it very transparently, but it's gonna have the consistency of that of like a full bodied paint. And so it's a, it's a, not very many people use this, it seems like, but it's, it's such a cool tool to be able to use, to be able to basically change the texture and the transparency of a paint without like completely messing up your fat overlaying um, uh, kind of respecting that hierarchy. So I, I put some of this pig, uh, this chalk directly into the mix, which was pretty stupid because uh, it kind of just like sunk to the bottom. <laughs> and so it's hard to kind of dissipate into the medium. So if you, a trick that I learned when I was making the black oil um, is if you basically kind of mold that, that uh, chalk, which is essentially making that putty just really concentrated off to the side to begin with, and then you put that in so the oil's already bounded around the chalk. When you put it into the uh, your pot and mix it around, it'll be already introduced to the oil, and so it won't like separate and clump or anything like that. It'll just be much easier to dissipate in it. So I'm adding some of this. You can see how like kind of stringy and kind of uh, it is, um, but but this is still like hardly any. I, like this still would be much uh, similar to a gel than a putty, but I'm going to be adding in a bunch of marble dust. Uh, but I, I'm going to be saving some of this. But the, the marble dust is what I really like to add to get that stringiness and turn it into a putty, because the the marble dust is much heavier than the chalk. Like if you feel the, the like a five kilo bag, it's super dense, which is really cool because the the heaviness of it kind of 
uh, like gravity affects it stronger when you put a brush mark onto the, the painting. So it, it just kind of helps blend the marks slightly. Like you can still preserve your brush strokes if you want, but it just kind of stitches everything in together really nicely. And so I, I really like using the, the marble dust for that. Marble dust is more toxic than chalk. You have to be careful about it. It's super fine, which is also really nice because it's super easy to bowl because it doesn't clump at all but it is more toxic if you get it into your system, so you gotta be careful about that. You can see this, this red color is because of the black oil that I've used, but it's like, I could mix this red in, or this, this medium in with some lead white, and it might turn it just the slightest amount warmer, but it, it won't affect it at all because it's so transparent. So you can see this was a complete and utter fail um, in just every way. I don't wanna talk about this. So I use my quick thinking and decided because I only wanted to save like two tubes of this stuff, and then I wanted to mold the rest with the with the marble dust. Um, so you can see, I was like, oh, maybe I can get it back in. Ooh, this would be nice to save. Um, which it was already kind of setting up as it was hitting the cool glass on the table. And then I was like, no, this is pretty stupid. So I just decided to leave this on the glass, and that will be my starter for, for molding in the uh, the marble dust, which makes a lot more sense. So then I was like, okay with like spilling it a little over on this one because I had the molar right underneath me. There we go. So I got like two, it, it actually didn't get the tubes too messy or that messy at all. Um, but now I have my, uh, my medium that I can add the marble dust to. And so this is where it gets very experimental. I'm just playing around with essentially figuring out what consistency I like or I, I want to use. The more you add, the more kind of thick it, it will be, so it will be kind of stronger uh, and kind of denser, but there's kind of like a balance of like the optimal amount of kind of strength, but then also like looseness and flexibility that gives you like the most kind of sharp and stringiness. So I'm playing around with trying to find that balance. I'm using my palette knife to kind of incorporate it more. This is so I can like keep my head further away from it and just so like when I start mulling it, I don't get a bunch of like dust that shoots up in the air. I probably should have done it a little bit better, but this was good enough. Um, so I'm mulling it all together and you'll see that like the white completely disappears. It just turns back into the color of the medium with it being like slightly lighter. This also is a little lighter because the beeswax is starting to cool and it's um, making it a bit more opaque. But yeah, so the, the this marble dust is so incredibly transparent and the black oil, which is making this kind of the orange color is so incredibly transparent that I'll show you at the end of this video, mixing it in with lead white doesn't affect the color at all. It's so bizarre how it doesn't change at all. Okay, so here's the moment of truth. So I bottled up the, the putty that I was mulling uh, previously, and you'll see this looks like a completely different color. This, this is, has to be from the beeswax cooling down and adding a bit of opacity. Uh, and also maybe the light, I think the lighting where I was mulling was much warmer because it is, it was a little discolored, but it turned out quite white. I think it was just when it fully cooled down, it, it turned more white. Um, so you can see how nice this is, kind of how sharp and crisp I can get some lines. This is just the medium. There's no pigment added into it. There's no white or anything like that. Um, so this is the, this, I would have a little scoop of this on my palette if when I'm getting to the stage where I'm using it. And you could either kind of mix in the ratio into each of your palettes of paints so it is extremely controlled or you can just kind of have it off to the side and kind of introduce it in as needed. So just like the true color of the medium compared to this is the homemade lead white I made over the last summer and so you can see that it is kind of a beige color and then what I just put down was just pure titanium white and so I'll be showing you kind of how the characteristics of each of these behave on their own and then when I add this medium into it. Now titanium white is extremely, extremely, extremely opaque and uh, lead white is extremely transparent. And you can see how kind of short the titanium white is compared to this homemade lead white which is much more long. But what is really interesting and what I think a lot of people have practical uses for because like I couldn't afford to make or, or to buy lead white and this quality, it's just so incredibly expensive because nobody uses it. But one possibility could be to make like this medium or a medium similar to this and add it into the titanium white and it will give it a bit more warmth, it will give it much more transparency, it will expedite the drying time, and it will give it stringiness, which are all the characteristics of lead white 
Uh, obviously it won't be as much of the lead white, even just the pure lead white without any of this medium added in. I, I, I don't think you could ever get the titanium white that long, but you can see that is a big difference from how short that was originally. So like this could be really nice for like plein air painting um, because I, I like the opacity of the lead white or of the titanium white, but it might be nice to just kind of expedite the drying time a little bit and give it a little bit of variety with the stringiness. So here's the lead white and the medium. So you can see it really doesn't change it that much. It does a very small amount, but you know, if you're making like really bright skin tones, like highlights on the skin tones, there are gonna be colors in that. So I don't think you're ever gonna get brighter than that. You can see how it's just lying down really sharp lines. Um, I'm thinking of like Van Dyke paintings, like that portrait and some of the, like the effects you could get with this. I really wanna make like a nightscape of a, of a guy in a boat in the water I'm working on and I'm going to be using this for some of the sharp highlights in the, in the wave that the moon is reflecting. So there's a lot of uses I'm really excited for. So again, you can kind of see how short that is versus the titanium white with the medium versus the lead white, which lead white itself is really nice, but then just to kind of give it a bit more looseness with the lead white and the medium. 